Sadek, thank you so much for joining me here at LSI Europe. Oh, thank you for having us. Tell me a little bit about your company. Yeah, so AccuCardia is a company that's in the software as a medical device space. Mm -hmm. We work largely with ECG devices at this point, ECG devices of any kind, essentially from ambulatory holters through to wearables, through to even bedside monitors. And what we're essentially helping these device companies with is to run analytics, reports, filter the noise out of you know, really noisy data, find the signal within that and make that actionable to them. So Tell me a bit about how the technology works. Yeah, so effectively, we have a combination of different um, approaches that we take in terms of our analytics. There is a decent amount of electrical engineering, particularly around signal processing um, that goes on. We also, we also do a decent amount of image analysis. Um, we use AI, but we use it in a very sort of surgical type of way. We are not necessarily using what I think of as brute force AI, which mm -hmm. is just dumping a lot of data at it and um, you know coming up with a black box result as far as arrhythmia, for example, is concerned. We leverage it in a way that allows us to work with actually very little data, but still come up with very critical insights using AI. It's a different approach, frankly, to doing AI than what you've probably seen or heard. It's, it's in some ways a small data approach to AI versus the traditional big data approach to AI. That's a 180 from what you've been hearing for years about you know, big data. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, the analogy I give people is, think about it this way, right? If you're, um, say, an infant or mm -hmm. someone that's maybe four or five years old, maybe a little bit older, right? And you want the, the, the five-year-old to recognize a cat, assuming they have never seen a cat, right? How many images of a cat does the five-year-old need to see before they can recognize cats for the rest of their lives? Maybe a dozen? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I would guess like yeah. five. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably even less, right? The association is made quickly, you would think. Correct, and, and there is something at play there beyond what I think of as brute force. Now, if you wanted an AI to recognize a cat, you need at least a million images. Right? Really? Right, because that's how traditional machine learning-led AI works. It's in many ways, calling it AI, calling it mach well, machine learning maybe as a term is all right, but AI as a term is slightly misleading. What it really is is very advanced statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. True AI goes a bit beyond that. I, I, you know, maybe don't want to stretch our claims, but I do think what we're doing is much more true AI and leveraging data in a very intelligent way versus brute force you know, machine learning led AI in some sense. So what's the key to small data then? Is it recognizing a digital biomarker or could you- That's, maybe... that's part of it. Um, that is definitely part of it. There's also the ability to, to pre-process data to some degree, to make it a lot more, um, in some sense, lean in, in using. I can't get too much into the details of exactly what we're doing sure. because honestly speaking, there is, there's an IP element to that <laughs> that I want to be very careful with. But, um, you know, there is, it, it, it's, it's, it, I kind of think of it as the difference between learning and understanding. You know, I think once my head of our chief scientist, uh, Naveed Srinivas, the guy that actually invented this, this solution, um, now, all of this goes back to research that he did starting in 2005 at the University of Sussex here in England. And, um, you know, he worked with um, a professor by the name of Dr. Inman Harvey, who's one of the leading, um, leading thought leaders in the space of evolutionary computing and adaptive systems. A lot of the research that he did for Naveen in particular for his thesis then over the years led to him developing very sophisticated models using a very different approach to AI, frankly speaking. So not, not, nothing that we're doing has come out of, you know, sort of a serendipitous moment, which uh, Naveen was sort of able to apply in ECG. It's, it goes back much further. It goes back to core, um, uh, the core of how you approach an AI problem in the first place. What indications are you looking at with your technology? 
Yeah, so in the case of e ECG in particular, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of morphology that you can get from ECG data. You're looking at, you know, what, what are called QRS signals, you're looking at R peaks, you're looking at, you know, patterns that, that indicate certain arrhythmias, you're looking at it at a micro level at some, at some sense, you're also looking at it at a more macro level. It's, it's essentially time series data. You need mm -hmm. to take that data and, and, and uh, extract some patterns out of it, both at the level of specific um, aspects of an ECG, but also from the point of view of, of a rhythm that you, you, you are looking at. So it's not just looking at a particular data point, but the series, a series of data points to establish what's happening in the ECG. That's fascinating. Yeah. What sort of uh, applications beyond ECG data could this technology be applied to? It's a loaded, loaded <laughs> question. Um, well, to be very honest, this can be applied to pretty much any type of data that has some patterns associated to it. It has to have a pattern. If there is no pattern, if you know, there is no such thing as truly random data, to be frank, so it probably can be used for a wide, as long as you can find a pattern, you can probably use it in a lot of different contexts. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of applications of it within healthcare itself. And I think where it really comes to play and, and, and shines at some level is, you know, when there just isn't that much data. There are a lot of use cases where you don't have um, a tremendous amount of data. I mean, think of context outside of healthcare geological events, for example, that happen once a million years, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to have big data in that context to be able to establish patterns and predict what might happen when, when you start seeing certain things emerge, right? So where it really starts to shine is where you don't necessarily have the ability to do big data. Even in the context of ECG, well, well it's a very, it's, it's, it's a space that's, mm -hmm that's generally agreed to between cardiologists as to what sta what sort of constitutes a certain you know arrhythmia you see a lot of disagreement even within cardiologists today as to what a certain rhythm might 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 indicate or what a certain pattern might indicate right so it, just to get very good label data even in something as as uh, um, sort of you know with, with as much of a history as, as ecg data has can be difficult leave alone things like let's take for example you know sound data c coming from the heart you know eeg data Th that type of data is even less um, available in some sense you know the amount of data that you have there particularly labeled data is 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 a lot less so you know the applications of it go are are, are perhaps even stronger in that context than than in a traditional ecg context the other thing about this, which makes it very interesting, is, is in some sense a consequence of this approach. Um, if you take sort of a traditional machine learning, big data approach to doing AI, one of the things you often end up with is a, you know, it, particularly with uh, you know, deep learning approach, is you end up with a, a neural network with well over 120, 100 layers in, in many cases. It's very hard to take that particular network and run it at the edge, to run it on a low compute footprint, mm -hmm. which in many contexts is critical, right? Now think about the context of where you need to identify a certain type of, of, of rhythm um, on a car, right? So one of the, the classic example that, uh, that comes to mind is one of the ways to determine if somebody is falling asleep in a car is to, to, to check for their heart rate and see if they're going into this condition called sinus bradycardia. That's mm -hmm. a better way to determine if somebody is falling asleep than you know, looking using computer vision algorithms to see if someone's eyelids are drooping, right? Really? In that, yeah, because it's it's a it's a clearer indicator. You can the, the machine can make mistakes with eyelids drooping. I mean, some people might have droopy eyelids to begin with, right? Yeah. So you get a lot of false positives. But bradycardia is a, is a is is a better indicator in that context. You can't depend on very heavy compute. You may not have cloud connectivity. You need those algorithms to run on a car computer versus the AWS cloud, right? Mm -hmm. You may need it to run in situations where there is no cloud connectivity at all. And you need to be able to respond, the car might need to respond in real time, perhaps take over the vehicle in certain contexts and go autonomous, mm -hmm. which is a lot better than the alternative of a person falling asleep and you know potentially crashing, yeah. right? Yeah. In all of those contexts, you know, using a traditional big data approach, 
to doing this is, is somewhat problematic. And that's just one example. There are examples of it in space, for, for instance, right? You don't have AWS on the International Space Station, mm -hmm. leave alone on a mission to Mars where there's a seven minute latency back to Earth. So there are a lot of contexts in which, you know, you need to come up with different approaches to, to leveraging AI and particularly the result of those AI models. And I think that's where we truly shine. That's fascinating. You know, this AI data analysis in healthcare, I want to say that it's, it's, it's been around for a little while now, but it's mm -hmm. still what I would consider to be an emerging market, especially when you start talking to hospital admins or physicians. Mm -hmm. A lot of them aren't aware of the different solutions out there. How big is the opportunity for just your, your technology alone? Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge with AI, and this is another, I think, advantage to our approach is the, the, um, they're traditionally black box approaches, whether mm -hmm. used on Wall Street or whether used in the context of, of a hospital setting. In the context of Wall Street, you know, people have gotten used to this idea of black box trading and occasionally you have like a flash crash as a result of AI and you start looking at you know, what's really in that black box, but for the most part, it's accepted. In healthcare, it's a lot different, right? You have people's lives at stake. Mm -hmm. So you need to have AI that's ex explainable, that, that doctors can look at the result of what the AI is saying and understand why it is saying that. Most AI approaches are not explainable. They're pure block, black box approaches. That, again, prevents adoption within the context of a hospital setting. If you can start peeling out the layers and showing how the AI got to, to, to the conclusion that it did, then the adoption just increases massively. Mm -hmm. People's trust in it increases massively. AI doesn't replace clinicians. It just makes their lives easier. But for it to make their lives easier, they have to first understand how it plays into the current context. What stage is uh, Acricardi at right now? Um, from, a, from a fundraising perspective, we are pretty early. We're in the seed stage. Mm -hmm. We've raised you know, close to about $3 million at this point. We're in the midst of a 2.5 million raise at the moment. We've raised about half of that so far and are gonna keep, you know, started raising last month, so we'll keep the raise open for another couple of months or so. Um, from a product point of view, we have our first product, which is focused on the ambulatory space, ready for, um, for FDA approval. We've uh, submitted the, um, we're actually submitting the filing with, with an arrhythmia coverage of about 18 arrhythmias which right off the back will be the broadest coverage any such device has on market once we, once we get the, um, the, uh, the approval. We've also been doing a lot of clinical research. Our first official clinical research was done with the Apple Watch um, with SUNY Downstate and HitLab in New York. Um, the, that research has been accepted and proved into a publication called GIMR, GIMR Formative and, and hopefully will be published later this fall but we are going to be doing a lot more clinical research and with, with a lot of other institutions as well um, that we are working through. And um, we are also in the process of uh, you know, doing, doing research-based projects. The reason we aren't necessarily fully commercializing yet with hardware manufacturers is because we need to get the approval, but we are working with them on a, on a research basis already across all of the different use cases. So the ambulatory use case, the the uh, wearables use case, um, except the inpatient telemetry one, we are going to have to wait for, we need to, to have a class three distinction before we can do that. That's really interesting. So how soon until your technology is running on this device it already, in a yeah. consumer sense? Yeah, that's a good question. So it already does in, a, in, in, in some sense, but in a clinical context, I honestly think our technology in a straight D2C where somebody can download an app and start using it, it's not that straightforward. Mm -hmm. Not that it can't work, it can work, right? I can, I, I, I use it today. I yeah. used it throughout the time I had COVID last year to check on whether or not my uh, heart rate was above a certain uh, level and, and, and to see what was going on. But the, the nature of our technology is that it can call very advanced arrhythmias. In that context, to do it without a you know, proper clinical guidance, right? For example, with you know, some of the dangerous ventricular arrhythmias that are mm -hmm. out there, you need to have some level of intervention in that situation, right? And so what I see really happening over time is not you know, a direct-to-consumer type 
there, there can be a version of that for, for just sort of more health and wellness purposes. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to true medical care, I think it's going to be a three-way collaboration of sorts between a wearable manufacturer, us, or a company like us, mm-hmm. um, which I don't think there are many, but yes, a company like us, um, and um, a, a, a telehealth company, right, which has the ability to do something and intervene in the event that a certain signal is picked up. So that's kind of how I see the space evolving. I, I, I'm not that there is no space for something that's D2C. I mean, Apple obviously has its own product that does that. But again, what does it really pick up? It picks up sinus rhythm, it picks up AFib, which yes, are critical, but there are arrhythmias beyond that that we have the ability to, to detect and do something about as well. So what brings you to LSI Europe? Um, <laughs> frankly, I haven't been out of the house, I guess, for, for a while now. So I was, I was telling someone earlier that, you know, I've just been pretty much working from home and remote for the last, uh, you know, three years. Mm-hmm. And this is, one of the first conferences that I've, I've, I've been to, and the reason we, we wanted to be here is, you know, to meet meet other um, OEMs, other other companies that are that are out there doing serious health and and med, and med tech, meet investors because we're in the midst of a raise as well, and um, and frankly get ourselves out there a little bit more because we, the founders of the company, myself, the CEO. Um, we are entrepreneurs, but we are not necessarily med tech entrepreneurs. This is the first time that we're building a med tech company as such. Mm-hmm. My, our CEO, Juan Jimenez, he is um, effectively a, a healthcare entrepreneur. Prior to this, he was the, uh, the, the, the CEO and president of the largest non-emergency medical transport company in the U.S. Um, you know, scaled it to about 30 million or so in revenue before I was able to convince him to come and join AccuCardia. But MedTech is still new to him. He knows how to deal with payers. He knows the, the, the healthcare ecosystem, particularly in the US, really well. Um, but you know, MedTech's its its own niche at some level, right? So it's important for us to, to really network and get to know the community as well. So that was the other big reason why it, it was important for, for us to come out here. Well, it's great having you here. Sadek, yeah. thank you so much for coming by and speaking with me. Thank it's you. a pleasure learning about your company. No, thank you for the questions and look forward to hopefully seeing you in the future as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I hope to see you at the next meeting. Thank you.